and ensure that ideological cuts that prolong the recession can be replaced by an investment in recovery. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Kezia Tagdale. Thank you, President Officer. This is my first opportunity in this chamber to pay tribute to Tom McCabe, who made such a contribution to this Parliament and to Scotland. I know I speak for the whole chamber when I say he will be sorely missed by members uh, from all parties. Can I ask the First Minister uh, what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day? First Minister. President Officer, can I also take the opportunity on behalf of my colleagues to pay tribute to the late Tom McCabe. He was, uh, I believe, the first member to be elected to this Parliament in 19. 99. He was a distinguished member of this parliament and a distinguished minister. But above all else, I think Tom McCabe was a fantastic human being. Um, I know he will be missed across the chamber, not least by his colleagues in the Labour Party, but particularly by his family. And our thoughts and condolences are with them at this time. Uh, later today, presiding officer, I will have engagements to take forward the government's programme for Scotland. Mm -hmm. <coughs> President Officer, this morning's Edinburgh Evening News exposes the SNP's candidate for Edinburgh South, Neil Hay, as an anonymous troll who described the majority of Scots as traitors. I am sure the First Minister will rightly condemn this and note that Mr Hay has apologised, but that is not enough. Will the First Minister sack Neil Hay as the SNP's candidate? First Minister. Well, Firstly, um, Kezia Dugdale is right. I do condemn the language used and I condemn the comments made, as I always do when anybody steps out of line on Twitter, on Facebook or in any medium. Neil Hay has rightly apologised. I think given that we face an election two weeks today, it's now up to the voters to decide. But I wonder if Kezia Dugdale would agree with me that it is important that all of us condemn intemperate statements on Twitter, regardless of where they come from. On the 4th of April, a senior Labour activist described the SNP as fascist scum. Now, will Kezia Dugdale, just for completeness, tell us what action Labour took against that activist? Kezia Dugdale. Um, if the First Minister had told me who that was, I'd be delighted to have responded to that. No, no, hang on a second. It would, a if she hasn't spelled out exactly who it is. I take it very seriously, and I will talk to her after today's First Minister's questions, because it would be hypocritical of me not to react to what she's saying, and I will do that with due consideration. I hope she'll take that seriously. Can I say, President Officer, the condemnation from the First Minister is welcome, but it, it doesn't go far enough. This is a man who is categorically challenging the right of pensioners to vote. He, I'm afraid he is. When you look at the detail of his tweets, I would encourage the SNP backbenchers just to take a minute and look at what he said. He is challenging the right of pensioners to vote in the general election. In recent weeks, the First Minister has had to apologise to victims of online abuse from her supporters. She's had to apologise to James Cook of the BBC, to Faisal Islam of Sky News, and to a young TV debate audience member who happened to say she liked what the Labour Party had to say. Rather than simply empathising with the victims, she needs to show some leadership and take on the perpetrators. And that starts with the sacking of Neil Hay. Yep. Yep. Now, you know it's yep. clear that the First Minister has a problem with words. Her candidate in Edinburgh calls more than half the population in Scotland traitors. And the last time we did First Minister's questions, Nicola Sturgeon couldn't even bring herself to utter the words full fiscal autonomy. Now, I know the First Minister doesn't agree with the assessment of the IFS and earlier this week described it as academic. So can she confirm when the SNP will publish their own costings of full fiscal autonomy for Scotland? First okay. Minister. Bear with me while I try to work my through, way through this diatribe of utter nonsense from the Labour Party. You know, I find myself, I find myself wondering two weeks out from polling day if we're ever going to get to a stage in this campaign where Labour tries to give the Scottish public a single positive reason for voting yeah. Labour. Is it, ever going, is it ever going to move on from SNP bad? Perhaps Labour should reflect on the fact that it's that kind of conduct and behaviour that is leaving them languishing in the opinion polls right now. Now, I think as Kezia Dugdale... Uh, quite well outlined in the first part of her uh, rather complex question there, 
that I do lead by example when it comes to calling out behaviour that I consider to be unacceptable. Absolutely. And I will always do that, regardless of who that unacceptable behaviour comes from. And in the case of Neil Hay, I am doing it today. He has apologised and the voters get the chance to cast their verdict two weeks today. But in uh, direct response to Kezia Dugdale, uh, the senior Labour activist I was referring to is Ian Smart. Uh, he appears regularly on the television uh, for Labour, putting across the Labour case. He described uh, us as the heirs of Arthur Donaldson, uh, fascist scum then, fascist scum forever. That was in the 4th of April. It's not the first time he's used remarks like that. And again, I would invite Kezia Dugdale, before she comes to me, lecturing me on what she expects me to do about SNP members, can I just politely suggest to her that she puts her own house in order first. And on, on her point about full fiscal autonomy, there you go, I've said it. Scotland's fiscal, order. Scotland's fiscal position, when we become fiscally autonomous, will depend on a number of things. It will depend on our economic performance between now and then. It will depend on the detail of a fiscal framework that will be agreed to determine Scotland's contributions to continued reserved responsibilities. It will depend on the treatment of taxes that under a devolved settlement can't be devolved, like VAT and excise duties. But do you know what? As I go around this country right now talking to voters, that's not what they're asking me about. They're asking what's going to happen now, this year, next year and the year after. I'm able to tell them that I want real term spending increases yeah. in every year of the next parliament. What we have Labour boasting about is that they're going to have cuts. So perhaps Kezia Dugdale will take the opportunity to tell us today how many cuts, how many billions and where is the Act going to fall under Labour? Dugdale. Mr. Dugdale. Mr. The difference is that Neil Hay passed the SNP's vetting procedure. Neil Hay is on the ballot paper. Now I take the remarks, what the First Minister has said about Order. you very seriously. Very seriously indeed. But Neil Hay is on the ballot paper. Yep. And I will not take any lectures from this First Minister about the conduct and behaviour of SNP activists. Now, on the issue of full fiscal autonomy, it's quite clear that the First Minister didn't like the question, but she owes the people of Scotland an honest answer. Because we know that the SNP's plans to cut Scotland off from UK-wide taxes would mean an end to the UK state pension for Scotland. Yep. Yep. Here's the thing. On page five of the SNP's manifesto, they claim to back UK-wide taxes like the mansion tax. Yet on page 11 of the same manifesto, they support ending UK-wide taxes. It beggars belief. So we know that the SNP's plans for full fiscal autonomy would mean massive austerity. Order. But we know that the plan for UK-wide spending would mean the same. Because this morning, the impartial experts at the IFS said that the SNP will impose austerity for longer than any other party. And that under the SNP, the block grant for Scotland will be cut. So can the First Minister tell us, why does she want to keep austerity going? First Minister. It's actually... Order, quite First Minister. difficult, and I mean this genuinely, it's quite difficult to take Labour or Kezia Dugdale seriously when they come to this chamber and they utter phrases like the SNP want to end the state pension. That's not just insulting the SNP, that is insulting the intelligence of every person across this country. And if anybody... And if anybody wants a reason, just crystallised in a nutshell, of why Scottish Labour is dying before our very eyes, then there is that reason. Now, I will continue to campaign in this election on a clear, consistent position. I don't want to see cuts over the next Parliament. I want to see, and it's quoted in the summary of the IFS report published this morning, increases in real terms in spending in each and every year. 
That is my position. Since this Parliament last met, we have had Labour trying to pretend they did not want cuts in Scotland to be slapped down by their bosses uh, from Westminster saying, no, there will be cuts. So does Kezia Dugdale want to take this opportunity to come clean? Tell us how much the cuts will amount to under Labour and where is the Act going to fall? These are the questions we are still waiting on an answer to. Kezia Dugdale. Ms. The First Minister very swiftly passed over this morning's news from the IFS because it is very serious news indeed for the SNP because it says that the SNP are offering to spend less than Labour and that they want austerity to last longer than any other party. That is what it says. She needs to read the detail of the report. Because the truth is, First Minister, you can dismiss some of the experts some Mr. of the time. Pippi and you can't Mr. Dismiss Smith. You can't dismiss all of the experts all of the time. The IFS says the SNP's rhetoric doesn't match the reality of their plans for continued austerity. The truth is, is that whatever the First Minister is calling it, full fiscal autonomy is a bad deal for Scotland. Yeah. It isn't autonomous. It isn't responsible. And after this morning, we know it simply isn't credible. The SNP can change the name of their policy, but they can't change the facts. Does the First Minister still think billions of pounds to cuts of Scots to schools Scotland to Scotland schools and hospitals really is just academic? First Minister. What a, a First total Minister. An utter ramble that was. <laughs> Let me just firstly, I have said repeatedly, and I'll say it again today, I do want to take longer to eliminate the deficit than other parties because I want to see us have the ability to invest more in our economy, in our public services and in lifting people out of poverty. That is a clear difference between my party and the other parties represented in this chamber. On the IFS report published this morning, it's full of assumptions and speculations. Give me, let me give you three, three points in which okay. it, gets, it gets the SNP plans wrong. Firstly, it does not credit for any increases in revenue uh, from the tax rises that we are proposing. Secondly, it gives no credit for the revenue we would increase from uh, cracking down on tax avoidance. Ironically, the report credits the SNP for being the only party not to simply make up figures on tax avoidance, but then unfortunately credits the other parties with the made-up figures. But the fundamental misassumption at the heart of the IFS report this morning is this one. It assumes that the SNP would cut borrowing by 2019-20 to 1.4 per cent of GDP. That is not our plan. Our plan is for borrowing in that year to be 1.6 per cent of GDP. So those are the, uh, what I would describe as misassumptions in the IFS report. But at the heart of the IFS report, in fact, in its summary, on one of the very first pages, is this statement. The SNP would increase total spending in real terms in each year. That is our position. We know from Labour, we know it from Ed Miliband, we know it from Ed Balls, we now even know it from Jim Murphy. Labour would impose additional cuts. So that's the choice people in Scotland have to make. They can have spending increases with the SNP or cuts with Labour, and the polls are beginning to suggest which one they prefer. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to add the condolences of myself and my party to the McCabe family. I knew Tom McCabe from the other side of the fence and interviewed him as a journalist, and he always struck me as a very strong Labour man, but fair in his dealings with everyone, and he was the very best of parliamentarians, and he will be missed. I would also like to ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. I have no near plans, oh, sorry, no plans in the near future even. <laughs> Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, the Scottish Government finally U-turned on its misguided plan to scrap corroboration. Yeah. It brought to a close one of the most shameful episodes in this Parliament's history. When legitimate concerns were raised last year, yep. the former Justice Secretary dismissed them as being part of a unionist conspiracy and accused opponents of, in his own words, selling out the victims of crime. Today, Lord McCluskey, who is the former Solicitor General, writes that concerns within the SNP's own ranks were silenced for fear that it would upset the independence referendum campaign. Lord McCluskey adds, and I quote, the way in which the SNP government handled this whole matter 
rings alarm bells for anyone concerned with the democracy in Scotland. I agree. Does the First Minister? First Minister. No, I don't. And I, I would say to Ruth Davidson, I'm not sure if she's ever tried to silence Christine Graham, but I can tell you, in my experience, it's simply not possible. But Ruth Davidson you know, raises an issue that I think is very important. I think it deserves to be treated seriously and substantively. The SNP government put forward the proposal to abolish the general requirement for corroboration for a very, very good reason. Because we and I suspect this objective is shared across this chamber. We want to see more people who commit crimes that are committed in private, crimes like sexual assault and rape, brought to trial and then, if guilty, brought to justice. That's the motivation here. And it's a good, sound motivation that I think everybody would agree with. The former Justice Secretary uh, then listened to the concerns that were being raised, which was why he asked Lord Bonamy to carry out the work that Lord Bonamy has now carried out. Lord Bonamy produced his report on Tuesday. I want to take the opportunity to thank Lord Bonamy and his team for the work that they have done. But they have recommended a range of changes to the justice system that they think should go ahead if corroboration is to be abolished. And the current Justice Secretary has rightly and properly decided that we need to take a pause and consider those reforms, such as uh, the, the substantive nature of them and such as the way they would change the justice system in the round and in a holistic way. So I actually take the view uh, both that the SNP government has handled this appropriately and correctly, but also we can evidence, because of the position we are now in, that concerns that have been raised have not been swept aside. On the contrary, they have been listened to and acted upon. And now this government and indeed this parliament has the time to look at these issues in the round. I think that's a good outcome and I think people across the chamber should welcome it. Ruth Davidson. Those raising concerns had sound motivations too and they were publicly traduced in this chamber by an SNP minister. And the First Minister's problem is that this isn't an isolated case. There is a pattern here of a majority SNP government steamrolling through its plans without any heed for rational or reasoned argument. And it's not just on corroboration. It's not just on offensive behaviour at football. Worst of all, it is named person legislation imposing upon every single child and young person a state-appointed guardian, stripping resource from those who need it most and interfering in family life for everyone. This First Minister has already delivered a U-turn on her predecessor's plans on corporation tax. She's U-turned on a new women's super prison. She's now done the right thing and U-turned on corroboration. Families are asking her on named person, will she do the right thing and U-turn on this too? I think First Minister... You know, I, I think Ruth Davidson has just demonstrated there why some people out there in the general public become so cynical about politics and, and politicians. When a government presses on with a plan, it's described as steam rollering. When we take the chance to listen and reflect and admit that we might not have got everything right, it's described as a U-turn. Actually, what we've done is the responsible and sensible thing. And Ruth Davidson's characterisation of the SNP government's approach to the issue of corroboration here is simply not borne out by the facts, if we had been determined to push ahead, regardless of the concerns that had been raised, the abolition of corroboration would have been done by now. It would already have been law. The fact that it's not proves the fact that we have taken the time, firstly under Kenny McCaskill, to set up the Bonamy Review, and now under Michael Matheson, to act responsibly on that Bonamy Review. And on the named person, you know, Ruth Davidson cannot go on describing things that are democratically passed by a majority of this parliament just because she doesn't agree with them. It's somehow against uh, the democratic wishes of the country. The named person legislation is about making sure we are doing everything in our power to protect vulnerable children. I stand by that legislation. I will continue to stand by it and I will continue to make sure I lead a government that does everything in its power to make sure the most vulnerable children in our society have the protection that they deserve. Stuart McMillan. Stuart McMillan. 
Thank you, President Officer. The, the First Minister will be aware that around 90 jobs are threatened at the DB Upper L Playtex factory in Port Glasgow. The company has been based there for many decades, and last week so the workforce were told about their potential future. What action can the Scottish Government take to try to save the jobs and assist the workforce in Port Glasgow? And can the First Minister assure me that representatives of the Scottish Government, its agencies and the PACE team will be in hand to assist those affected? First Minister. Well, uh, can I thank Stuart McMillan for his question? Um, I, like him, am very concerned to learn of potential redundancies at the DB Apparel factory in Port Glasgow. I know this will be an incredibly anxious time for the company's employees and for their families, and our thoughts are with them at this difficult time. Uh, can I give the assurance uh, to the Chamber that Scottish Enterprise is already engaging with the company and exploring all possible avenues for support? Uh, PACE support has been offered to the company for any employers who might be affected by redundancy and that support uh, will continue to be available. So I would uh, assure Stuart McMillan that the government and its agencies will do everything that we can to provide the support that is needed both to the company and to any employee who might be affected by a redundancy situation. Question three, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister for what reason unemployment has increased in Scotland. First Minister. Well, unemployment is down by 14,000 over the past year and it's now 70,000 below its recession peak in 2010. It is up over the last quarter, in part because more people are moving into the labour market who previously were not looking for work. Labour market participation, those who are uh, in work or actively seeking work, has now reached an all-time high at just under uh, 3 million. This increase, uh, of course, comes as last week's GDP figures confirmed that the Scottish economy continues to grow, and as demand grows and more people understand there are job opportunities to be had, they then enter the labour market. Gavin Brown. I'm not sure the answer, though, does actually fully respond to the question. The UK as a whole, the UK as a whole saw a significant decrease in both economic inactivity and unemployment while Scotland saw a decrease in economic inactivity, but an increase in unemployment. What is the First Minister's explanation for the difference? First Minister. Well, firstly, my answer directly addressed the question. The question was, for what reason has unemployment increased in Scotland? And I gave the direct answer to that. Uh, our employment rate, of course, is higher uh, than the UK's uh, employment rate. Our uh, inactivity rates lower, so we are performing well when it comes to employment. But what the recent increase in unemployment says is that there are more people coming into the labour market, and that means we've got to continue to work with our partners and with our agencies to make sure that we're helping those people into work. We will continue to do that, but the overall trends in the Scottish economy are positive, and we should not try to suggest otherwise. As more people see that there are opportunities in the economy, more people will come into the labour market looking for work and we will continue our efforts to support them as best as possible and of course as well as the work the finance secretary uh, does there we now have the cabinet secretary for fair work absolutely demonstrating the determination of this government to support people into employment but also once they are in employment making sure they get paid decent wages and have fair work and we'll continue to focus very very hard indeed on that. Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the First Minister would agree that the austerity agenda proposed by Mr Brown's party and signed up to by the Labour Party would have a negative impact on the economy and would hinder efforts to try and get more people into work in Scotland? First Minister. Well, in a sense, we don't have to look to the future to know that. We know that from the experience of the past five years. Economic experts, well, economic, there was one from Oxford University quoted yesterday saying that austerity over the past five years has held back economic yeah. growth. That is a fact borne out by the views of economic experts uh, right uh, across the country. So my argument is very simple. If we have fiscally responsible spending increases instead of cuts over the life of the next parliament, we can invest not just in protecting our public services and in lifting people out of poverty, we can invest in the kind of things that get our economy growing faster and that's got to be good uh, for everybody across the country. Question four, Christina McKelvey. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to investigate current and historic child sexual exploitation. 
First Minister. Well, child sexual exploitation is an abhorrent crime and has a devastating impact on its victims and their families. All children and young people have the right to be cared for and protected from harm and to grow up in a safe environment. We published the National Action Plan to tackle child sexual exploitation in November last year. It sets out a range of actions for the government and its partners, including the establishment of Police Scotland's National Child Abuse Investigation Unit, which was launched this week. The unit is going to provide specialist support to complex and serious child abuse investigations, including cases of child sexual exploitation. Uh, this diverse range of work, which we're undertaking in collaboration with partners across the country, will help to ensure that incidences of child sexual exploitation are identified and acted on, and that perpetrators are brought to justice. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? The First Minister will know that for victims to be believed and to have trust in the system is paramount. So can the First Minister reassure the victim groups and the individuals I have worked with that the police and the support services stand ready to ensure that the victims receive the correct support to secure the justice they so badly desire? First Minister. Well, I can give that assurance. The safety and protection of children is essential, enabling them to, to reach their potential. Um, and we're absolutely committed to doing whatever we need to do to ensure that happens for all of our children. The government continues to work in partnership with Police Scotland, also with the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, to do all that we can to give those who've been exploited, abused or harmed uh, trust in the system so that they can come forward to tell what has happened to them, knowing that they're going to be listened to and with the confidence that where there has been criminal activity, it will then be investigated and prosecuted appropriately. That's why we've supported the establishment of the National Child Abuse Investigation Unit. Um, you know, I glance at some of the appalling stories uh, that appear in our newspapers of sex offences committed against children demonstrates the need for that specialist unit. But it also shows that our approach in supporting a National Sex Crimes Unit in the Crown Office is also working because that makes a difference in successfully prosecuting these heinous crimes and working to keep our children safer. So we will continue to do everything we can to ensure the safety of our children, what must be one of the most important responsibilities, of, not just of any government, but of any society. Ian Gray. Uh, President officer, yesterday evening the Cabinet Secretary for Education wrote to members to tell us that the announcement of the chair panel uh, and the remit of the public inquiry into historic child abuse will be delayed until next month. We all want to get this right, but the First Minister must understand that this delay will damage the fragile trust survivors have in the process. Can she give us a guaranteed date for the announcement to help allay the concerns of those survivors? First Minister. Well, can I say this to Ian Gray? And I hope he takes it as a, a genuine request to him for his cooperation here, because I think if we all work together across the political boundaries in this chamber, we can make sure that our efforts to get this right do not damage the trust uh, of those who have the, the biggest interest in this inquiry. Uh, Angela Constance, as Ian Gray said, wrote to members last night to say there will be a slight delay in the announcement of the terms and the chair of the inquiry. And the only reason for that is that we are determined to get this right, because it is so important uh, to the victims of abuse that we do get it right, and they get the opportunity to have their experiences uh, recounted and recorded, uh, and to have the sense uh, that they've got the, the justice that they're looking for. So please, I would, you know, this is a plea to everybody across this chamber, hold this government to account by all means, but let's not divide on this issue. Let's make sure we work together to ensure that this is a process that builds trust and confidence uh, and doesn't help to undermine it. Question five. Aline Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to recent reports that police officers are manipulating the recording of crime statistics by using their discretionary powers to prevent reported incidents being recorded as crimes. First Minister. Well, recorded crime in Scotland is subject to independent, rigorous and transparent inspection and regulation involving scrutiny by the National Crime Registrar, the Scottish Police Authority and Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland. In November 2014, uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate published its largest independent audit to date of police incident and crime recording decisions, and that audit found that Police Scotland's own auditing of crime recording is good. Aline Murray. 
her re response, but unfortunately the Scottish people do not seem to have confidence in Police Scotland's crime statistics. A recent survey by the Scottish Police Authority reports that three quarters do not believe the Scottish Government's assertion that crime in Scotland is falling. In light of the reports in, in the press at the weekend, will the First Minister ask Audit Scotland to undertake an investigation into the accuracy of recorded crime statistics as a matter of urgency so that victims of crime can be confident that the crimes they report are not being downgraded to meet crime statistic targets? Is this another McCaskill mess that his successor will be forced to try to rectify? First Minister. Well, I, I took time in my original answer to set out uh, the inspection and regulation that recorded crime is already subject to in Scotland. And I, I thought that would have been uh, an assuring uh, answer uh, for the member, but clearly, uh, clearly not. Anyway, let me have another go. You know, people contact the police for a variety of reasons, which generally result in an incident being created on the command and control incident management system. Uh, many incidents such as assisting the public or crime prevention activity are recorded, but they don't result in a crime report being raised. That long-standing practice is routine, it's legitimate, and it's completely in line with other police forces. And interestingly, the audit that I referred to earlier on, part of that audit looked at non-crime related incidents, uh, those incidents that are reported to the police but never result in a crime report. And the audit found that the vast majority, 87% to be precise, uh, of the more than 1,200 such incidents that they sampled had been classified co correctly. And only a minority, 6% of the incidents that had not been classified correctly, actually related to a crime clearly being committed but no crime report being traced. So I would have thought that the views of Her Majesty's Inspectorate, where in this audit they described uh, the recording of uh, crime and incident decisions as good, I would have thought that should have been uh, sufficient for the member. Uh, but we'll continue to make sure that these things are robustly scrutinised because the general public, and this is where I do agree, have a right to know that and have confidence in the system. Question six, Claire Adamson. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the figures from the Trussell Trust suggesting that the number of people in the UK relying on food banks is expected to pass one million. First Minister. Well, the number of people experiencing food poverty is increasing and that is utterly unacceptable in a country as prosperous as ours is. The Trussell Trust figures continue to show that the most common reasons for people using food banks are benefit changes, delays and low income, uh, and the UK government must take the responsibility for the impact of its welfare reform, or welfare cuts, as I prefer to call it, programme. Uh, we're investing almost £300 million, including a million pounds over the next two years, to combat food poverty to help those most affected by these changes. Uh, however, if we want to see a reduction in those being forced to rely on food banks, then we need a party that will seek to reverse the undoing of our social security system, not continue to rip it apart. And that's uh, what my party wants to do. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree that with mounting evidence from the third sector and indeed from frontline professionals, that the austerity policies of the UK coalition government have had a devastating and appalling effect on the most vulnerable in our society, and that the way to achieve a progressive alternative is to vote SNP on the 7th of May. First Minister. Well, the austerity agenda. Order. The Labour benches seem to be getting quite excited there at the prospect of voting SNP on May the 7th. Maybe there's more doing it. Maybe there's more going to do it than even we uh, expected. Uh, the austerity agenda that the coalition parties have presided over and want to continue and the cuts that Labour uh, clearly want to continue will drive more and more people to food banks. And we know that if the Tories get the way, the worst of welfare cuts are still to come. I do want to see an alternative to that. I do not believe it is right that we continue to see some of the most vulnerable people in our society driven into poverty. That's why I want a reversal to the cuts, modest spending increases, and why this government will continue also to prioritise getting more and more people onto the living wage. So we'll keep doing that and we'll keep standing up against the cuts that would make this matter worse. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.